Megan feeling pretty good? Grandma, you had a little extra energy this morning? Amen? Yeah. No, uh, gosh, it's, uh, it's good to get that, I don't know if it's fooling us, that extra hour, daylight savings time went away, and now we got this, like, oh, gosh, 4.30 in the afternoon is dark. What is that? So we get the, uh, the two sides of it. I know Dwayne has told me that is the, uh, really like the biggest holiday of the year. Oh, the most glorious Saturday night ever. Of course, hopefully the snow's coming and there's, <laughs> there's nothing in the air. But uh, we, speaking of glorious Saturdays, gosh, excellent segue there. Wow, bam. And off of just some beautiful praise and worship, let me, uh, I'm going to introduce a, a young man here to you in a moment. And, uh, but yesterday we had our family field day. And uh, oh my goodness, what a day. Now, it started off a little windy. And archery and arrows, eh, but God stilled the wind a bit. But beyond that, weather, that's just the weather. Our time in the Lord, our time with the people. There was a bunch of kids that came, a bunch of moms and dads that came. And they participated in our family field day, uh, sponsored by and centered up on missionary Aaron Shear and Center Shot Experience and, and uh, the guys that he brought with him. We just had a sweet time in that the gospel was presented the Lord was magnified and glorified, and we as a people were, uh, gosh, my cup runneth over because of what God did in his spirit by his word. And so um, the guys hung around for a little bit. We, we uh, took them to McDonald's last night for a little meal, uh, and that was really good. We had a little, little cheeseburger, and uh, we wanted to fatten them up before they go back to Green Bay, Wisconsin, but they're going to head out today. But before they do, they wanted to hang out with us and Sunday and worship. And we had a day of worship yesterday. So uh, we're just worshiping indoors today. But without further ado, I want to give Aaron a few minutes here to come up and uh, just share the work and share his heart. Please welcome Aaron Shear. Thank you. Well, good morning. Can everybody hear me okay? Wow, it is so special to be here. This is like, we were talking this morning, we don't even really want to go back home. This is like family right here. We should just stay. It is a lot warmer. It is a lot warmer. That is good. Uh, we had just a beautiful day yesterday. What a special group of volunteers and everybody that helped. It was so great to work with you and, and just to see what God did as we just tried to love uh, and let Christ's love come through us. And, and it happened. We saw it. We saw it happening. So... Um, just a testament, you know, my background uh, was shaped and formed by uh, a lot of the men here in this church, uh, two specifically. So Pastor Brownie and uh, Dr. Bobby Bonner were major mentors in my life. And a lot of what we do with the ministry of Center Shot, um, those, those years of that mentorship played into how we're structuring the work of minor, uh, the ministry of Center Shot. So Center Shot, a little bit about that. Center Shot is an archery ministry for churches that they can host archery camps and archery leagues and introduce people to the, the amazing sport of archery. You know, and archery is all through scripture. We're going to talk about that a little bit. It's pretty interesting the amount of faith development that can happen when you're talking about archery in the scriptures. Um, there's a partner organization we partner with, National Archery in the Schools Program, and right now, archery is exploding all over the country and all over the world. Um, it's the fastest growing sport. Uh, we have about 1.4 million kids from fourth through 12th grade that are taking and participating in this international style of archery. We shoot uh, bullseye targets, and we shoot some 3D uh, foam shapes and animals, and. Um, you know, it's, it's teaching good discipline. It's, it's a sport that really helps focus develop. Um, you learn respect for authority. There's so many great character traits that come from archery. But when we start to look at the scriptures and how they come alive through archery, 
Wow, is it exciting. It's neat. So I want to show you one of our little tools and demonstrations. This is one of the bows that we actually use. Um, it's a, a Genesis bow. That's the first thing. So it's the it's a first bow that you would start with. Uh, it's universal draw length. So if you're small or doesn't matter how big you are, you can anchor. And one of the beautiful things about, you know, we just believe God loves archery. Um, when you're teaching kids where to find their anchor point, you start like this. Because God gave every one of us a perfect anchor point. It's the corner of our smile. So we start with this and we move that to the corner. of our, So when you draw back, you anchor at the corner of your smile. So um, this bow is a tool that we use. Uh, this is the center shot life bow, and it's a story of the life giver, the one who gives us life. And we notice that the top limbs are separated. These top limbs are separated, and it's a picture of how we're separated from God. You know, back in the ancient days when the archers would shoot, they would have a target way downfield, and there'd be a, off to the side, there'd be a... Um, someone that was calling out. There would be a spotter that would call out, and they'd put a mark on a target, and if you hit the mark, they would yell, Mark. And if you missed the mark, the spotter would yell, Sin. Sin is an archery term. It means to miss the mark. So as we're teaching kids, and they're learning, boy, you know, it's hard to hit the bullseye every single time. But... That's where God lives. He hits the bullseye every single time. So we begin to see very clearly how we're separated from God. And all through life, we're going to have some misses. We're going to have some sin that keeps us separated. And God says, no, I want you part of my family. And when, we, this, when we're teaching the kids the, the parts of a bow, we teach them about the riser. That's this red part. The riser on a bow is where all of the forgiveness and all of the strength comes from right? This riser has a rest on it. So this riser gives you the strength and the forgiveness. It gives you rest. And anything that touches this riser turns white as snow. This riser represents another riser, the one who rose on the third day. This is Jesus, the riser. So we teach them to receive the riser and draw him to you. So this riser begins to help the kids understand, wow, I'm separated from God, but if I receive the riser, he makes me white as snow and I have a place from God. Oh my goodness, the blue represents the living water. I'm going to get baptized, die to myself, be raised in the newness of Christ. Now what? Well, the green cam, this is a compound bow. This is a compounding effect. When the green cam, when you open your heart to learn in God's ways, there's a compounding effect, right? And then the yellow and the blue, the string here, represent the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. And as they become intertwined in your life, you find your home in heaven on the streets of gold. That's the story. So as we're doing... Thank you. So you have this eight-week curriculum that you're teaching the kids the parts of the bow, but they're learning in depth the parts of the gospel story. Or you have an eight-minute dis description. So when we do a big awards assembly, this is what we share. Or when we do an eight-week league, this is how the curriculum works. So there's multiple different curriculums. That's just an example of one, but that's our ministry. We just go around. It's amazing. We, we, we kind of laugh all the time. We're just wandering around sharing the gospel, and man, it's amazing what God does. We just wander around. So we'll be in uh, Ohio next uh, couple weeks. We're on the road a lot. Uh, sharing the gospel, but we put on these large tournaments, so kids, they shoot in their league, they have something to go and, and compete in a national tournament. We do a Western National in Salt Lake City area, and we do an Eastern National tournament in Louisville, Kentucky. And there's right now the largest archery tournament in our joint partnership with NASP. This last uh, year, in 2019, we had just shy of 15,000 archers at the Eastern National Term. And every one of them gets to be introduced to this little story. Amen? So that's our ministry. This is what we do. Thank you.
Thank you, Aaron. Now, Aaron, just to make sure that the guys don't kick you out of the truck, make sure you introduce the two guys that came along with you. There you go. This is their team. Dan Simons. Dan Simons. Please stand up. Please stand up. Uh, and Mark Beasley. These are two brothers in Christ that uh, God has put us together and uh, two incredibly highly competent men that keep everything organized and structured and just love the Lord. And they're, uh, it's an awesome team to be a part of. Amen. So, thank you, thank Aaron, you. so much. <laughs> Tremendous. Open your Bibles to Matthew chapter number seven. Isn't that great? Whoa, we had a time... Uh, and thank you, Lord, and we're looking forward to being in their corner and partnering with this ministry. They believe in seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all the things that God says he'd do, he'll add unto you. That is our theme verse of our study out of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're going to continue. We've got a, a couple more messages in here, so we're in chapter number seven, and we're going to look at the first 14 verses, but when you have the opportunity to uh, jump in on presenting the gospel in some form or fashion and be able to, hey, team that, hey, candy team, lunch team, praise the Lord, thank you guys, all you volunteers that did so much, thank you so much, uh, thank you for, uh, we've, we passed out a couple hundred bag lunches that included uh, God's all-American food, hot dogs, and, uh, and God's all-American dessert, Oreos. And, uh, and then, of course, we made sure that all the kids got a bag of candy. And in that bag of candy was a gospel track, the little red book tracks that we have about in the lobby. Also a neat little uh, bookmark that uh, Aaron had sent a design, and we redesigned it to fit in that little bag. Also, the clean heart track for children, so that they have that. And uh, they got a little Snickers and a little Three Musketeers and stuff like that. But uh, all those bits and pieces, and, and this is God's work. This is doing that which God called us to do by faith. It's uncommon. Uh, as we look at our theme and be reminded of uh, what God showed us the first week of, uh, of uh, October, where we're reminded that most men proclaim everyone their own goodness. People talk about themselves, about what they do, but a faithful man who can find, and as God showed us the, the bookends of uh, righteousness, the bookends of his assignments and everything through, through Pastor Brian and, and through Bobby and through everyone, we're reminded that this is a faith walk, doing that which God called us to by faith and seeing his grace on the other side of faith and then seeing him change lives. We had, uh, Bobby said, about a dozen children and families came up to pick up a New Testament afterwards after the gospel was presented and the kids had an opportunity and the parents to receive Christ so that's very encouraging, and that's a, a place where uh, we encouraged. Bobby had a conversation or two. I had one with someone else, and, and so we pray that that will continue, and it's another piece and part of God's kingdom work through First Bible Baptist Church. We're his local called-out work here up on the hill doing that which he'd have us to do. When you think about what Jesus Christ is doing here in Matthew 7, we're again reminded that he's making this very personal for his audience, and that's what Jesus Christ does. When you have some presentation like that, that's a personal presentation. Oh, that sounds good, and that's bells and whistles. No, no, that's the Spirit of God using archery to declare the gospel. Here's Jesus Christ on the Sermon on the Mount. He's on a mountain top, and as we're reminded back in chapter number 5, that it says he's seen the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him. He's got the disciples sitting close to him. He's teaching them and training them, but he's also preaching to these Jewish people that need to know that their own righteousness is getting them nowhere. That if their righteousness isn't founded in the one that's speaking, then they're in trouble. And they rejected the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, for us, church, we know that it's a different setting for us today. It's a different setting for us now. We have the Word of God in our laps, and, and we're able to realize what it takes to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. And yet still... Still, we get to a place where understanding what Jesus Christ is teaching here 
it kind of pierces us and puts us in a place of, again, more self-examination, more spiritual inventory. We need to look at our life in a way and say, okay, I need to take a little bit of home inspection. Randy Adams is sponsoring this message today, Adams Home Inspection. Uh, but we're going to do a little home inspection, but not your house, but this home. Because Jesus Christ is inspecting these Jewish people and also having them look at how they need to inspect themselves. Remember again, the disciples are being taught. They're being trained. This is one of their very first training modules, if not the first, when they said, I'll follow you, Jesus, after he said, follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Jesus trained and taught his disciples while he's preaching to the Jews. Only Jesus can accomplish all that he did. And in this home inspection message today, we're going to look at just a few simple things. And, and we're going to, again, look at the first 14 verses. And, and that's what we're going to read. And, and they, I'll leave this little outline up as we read through the passage of Scripture and be reminded, hey, we're going to cover what Jesus says on judging. We're going to cover what Jesus says on prayer. And he references prayer again, the golden rule which Jesus not, did not call the golden rule, and we're going to really look at it for a moment or two here and see what he's meaning. And of course, the two ways of life found in verses 13 and 14. So with that as a little bit of an introduction, a great testimony from our brother on, on what God really is doing and at work here in the kingdom of God work. Now we get into the word of God this morning, and let's see for the next few minutes what God has for each one of us personally. Verse 1, chapter number 7. Judge not that ye be not judged. For with what judgment ye judge, ye shall be judged. And with what measure ye meet, it shall be measured to you again. Why beholdest thou the mote that is in thy brother's eye, but consider not the beam that is in thine own eye? It's amazing how many people, by the way, know this text a little bit who are lost, religious, and go, you don't judge me, you can't judge me. Seriously? We'll look into that in a little bit deeper because no one likes to be judged improperly. An improper judgment can be so condemning. It can be wrong, but the proper type of judgment that is taught from the Bible is from the Lord Jesus Christ. But it goes back to the home inspection. It really does. I've got to inspect my home my home inside of here. Because verse number four says this, or what wilt thou say to thy brother? Now, of course, he's referencing this kingdom brother, this Jewish brother, but we take it in a place of referencing our spiritual brother. What about that? Let me pull out the mote out of thine eye, and behold, a beam is in thine own eye. How can I dare go after what's in your eye when I have something in my? Verse five, of course, that word that we have talked about, I don't like being called a hypocrite, do you? Don't like being called a liar, do you? Those words just really cut to the core. You're a cheater. Oh, that, I would not want to be accused of that, but Jesus says, thou hypocrite, first cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Then shalt thou see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. I believe this next verse kind of ties into those before, even though in your paragraph, it has a little bit of paragraph marking if you have a Bible like that. I believe it ties in in this way. Give not that which is holy unto the dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them under their feet and turn again and rend you. By the way, in order for you to use that verse and apply it, you'd have to judge somebody, wouldn't you? Whether they're a pig right? Should I speak to someone and give them the words of life and this precious, beautiful gift? Should I, should I give someone who's a dog these beautiful things when they're going to trample on them? See, it's the judgment of the action, right? It's really evaluating and looking at things. And, and so Jesus puts that verse in there and you go, why did he do that? Because yes, we need to be circumspect, we need to look at circumstance, actions, and things that go on. But here's where it really gets deeper in the home inspection. Verse number seven. Now here's A-S-K. 
ask. So Jesus is going to mention a little more about prayer. Don't forget, he's already taught us a little bit about prayer. If we went back to chapter number 6, he talked of the disciples' prayer, which he also spoke of in Luke 11. It's not really the Lord's prayer. The Lord's prayer is in John 17, right? That's when he prayed to the Father in heaven. This is the disciples' prayer. Because they asked him in Luke 11 how to pray. So they've already gotten a little bit of background on how to pray. So he says in verse number seven, a a method of how we can understand what it means to ask for things from the Lord. Ask, seek, knock. Ask and it shall be given unto you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. Verse eight, for everyone that asketh receiveth and he that seeketh findeth. And to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you? This is a great, great proverb from the Lord. Or what man is there of you? Whom, if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask him? Hmm. That's some good home inspection stuff right there. Verse number 12, therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them. For this is the law and the prophets. We'll get into that in a little bit here. We just think that is by the religious world or even just on those that want to say they do good. That's how they say, this is how I live my life, by the golden rule. Let's see what Jesus really meant by that here in a moment. Verse 13 and 14. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction. And many there be which go in thereat. Verse 14. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few there be that find it. Now thank you, Lord, for your word. We ask the blessing of your word, the teaching of your word by your Holy Spirit. We come here in the name of Jesus Christ. We want to have the Holy Spirit teach us by the power of his office, not by anything that I can do as a man. Thank you for Aaron Centershot, the ministry that truly gave the gospel in your kingdom yesterday. Continue to use them and bless them. And God, speak to us personally. Make this a home inspection time for each one of us. Again, in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The verse is up on the screen. Verse number 12. You can look down in your Bible again or just look up at the screen. The golden rule verse in the middle of this. Let's just look at this for a moment. I believe it's very, very important. Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do you even so to them. Or, as the mafia says, do unto them before they get you. Okay? That's the Jewish mafia my father-in-law is part of. Uh, His birthday today, the 80th birthday of the Milton Swartz of Rochester, New York. He's called the Transmission King. Uh, I got a funny feeling. It's because, as he used to say, he was a very big fan of Jewish lightning, which meant that some shops would somehow disappear. I don't know if he had anything to do with it at all, but if you know anything about Jewish lightning. um, Anyway. Get at those people before they get you. That's where a lot of this was formulated. You say, that's not what the verse says. Well then, do unto others as they do to you. So if somebody drops off for Christmas a case of whiskey, are you going to reciprocate the gift and do the same because they did it for you? You see, it's an interesting thought how we take the golden rule idea because that means it's you translating what Jesus Christ is saying. But hey, there is some truth. In fact, there's a great deal of truth in what Jesus Christ is saying. And he is saying, look, 
Therefore all things whatsoever you would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. You know what he's meaning by the law and the prophets. Do you understand what he's referencing? He's referencing the law. From Deuteronomy 6, from Matthew, go to Matthew 22 real quick. I know that we don't have a lot of time, but this will just give you a quick reminder. Matthew chapter number 22. Write all those other references down. They're the references that Jesus Christ is speaking of. The first commandment and the second. He says in verse number 36, excuse me, it's asked of him by the Pharisees, excuse me, the Pharisees and Sadducees together, a lawyer asks him, or a scribe, don't forget the scribes and the lawyers, they're very, very particular about the law. They were the keepers of the law, they were the ones that wrote it down, and so he comes up and says, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Verse 36, I'm trying to trip him up a little bit, because it does say in verse 35, he asked him a question, tempting him. Aha, if you're really the master teacher, if you're really the Hebrew of Hebrews teacher that you say that you are, then I'm going to tempt you to find out what really the big law is. And of course, Jesus said unto them, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment. Number two, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Bingo. Does that help you? Study your Bible. Understand what Jesus Christ is saying. There's a lot more depth being said in verse number 12 than anybody really wants to recognize. Golden rule. Do you really love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, mind, and strength, Jew? Or you too, Gentile? Because he mentions the same thing in Mark chapter number 12. He also, in Luke chapter number 10, because Mark 12 was a reference with a similar confrontation from a scribe, so it is a similar uh, setting right there, and that's the same setting there. But in Luke 10, what's going on? Somebody came. Real quick, go there, Luke 10. Real quick, I know you're really fast. The electronic Bibles, you're going to beat me all there. Come on, I'm going to race you. I'm going to race you. Sword drills, sword drills, sword drills. I got it. Okay, here we go. Well, you're supposed to get it. You're the preacher. Okay, here we go. Verse number 25, page 1287 in your Bible. Here you go. And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tempted him. Aha! What's going on here? He says, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said, what is written in the law? How readest thou? He answered, and he puts it back on him. See, Jesus puts it back on him. To love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy strength, with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. He said, thou hast answered right, this do, and thou shalt live. But he willingly to justify himself, he did it. He did it. He asked the one more question. Jay, didn't you always love that kid in the youth group? I, I, me too, Jay, I got one more question. Well, you're going to ask it to justify himself. I love the Bible. God always throws in a little parenthesis, a little asterisk, just to let you know that behind the scenes, the reason why he's asking, and who is my neighbor, is to justify himself. And what does he go into? The great teaching of the Good Samaritan. And boy, that'll level you right there, especially if you're a Jewish person listening to Jesus' teaching there. Again, when we remember what Jesus Christ said to his disciples, and you can write down the reference for time, John chapter number 13, verse number 34. Some of you remember that. Some of you know that. What did he say? Ah, hi, I fooled you. It's up on the screen. There you go. And a new commandment I give unto you. What do I give you? That ye love one another, as I said in the Old Testament. Uh, 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 uh. As I have loved you. That's how you love one another. What's verse number 35 say? Greater love had no man than this. Lay down his life for his friends. Powerful. Powerful. You see, now we've got a little preview, a little context. What's going on in this Sermon on the Mount setting as Jesus is tying it all together? He's bringing something to you and me. He's bringing something of a house inspection, a home inspection for you and for me. You know what they do in a home inspection? Just a general thing. I know Randy's going to send me an email. But here you go. 
They checked the heating system, the central air if applicable. Up in New Hampshire, we, didn't have, we couldn't afford it. I mean, we had a little thing in the wall that would fall out, so you'd probably have to, eh, you'd failed. Interior plumbing, electrical systems, roof, attic, walls, ceilings, floors, windows, doors, foundation, basement, and on and on. They, they, hey, if you want Randy to come and inspect your house, he's going to do an excellent job. He is going to inspect your house to sell it. He's going to inspect your home. But here's the Holy Ghost, and he's inspecting my home. It's kind of like in my world and doing vehicle stuff. A vehicle inspection, just check the brake system, the exhaust system, the fuel system, the tires, and all that stuff. And you know how they come back and go, oh yeah, you owe me 500 bucks. Wait a minute. It was a $30 uh, little inspection sticker. Well, you had a few things wrong with your car. Do you want to drive your car out of here, or do you want to give me the 500 That's why I'm so rich from stealing so much money from people in the car repair industry. I'm just kidding. I just did transmission. So keep in mind this whole idea behind this simple home inspection over the next few moments and how you and I really see. Hey, I can inspect your car. Let me inspect your home. Uh, 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 uh. The Lord's saying you better inspect your own home. Here's a highlight, verse number five. I'm going to highlight verse number five, number 11, and number 14. Here you go. Thou hypocrite. We're back to that. Oh, that rough statement. But it's true. We need to hear this. Thou hypocrite. Okay. What are you saying? Thou hypocrite. First cast out the beam out of thine own eye. Oh, when you're going to inspect yourself, First, you got to get the beam out of thine own eye. I love the phrase, thine own eye. And then thou shalt see clearly to cast out the mote out of thy brother's eye. I need to check and look at mine own eye. A mote is a simple piece of straw, dry stock, maybe a little twig, or maybe you know how when you're out there, anybody wear uh, uh, um, contact lenses? Don't you love when a little something gets in there? No, you don't. I hear, That's why I don't wear contact lenses. Now I can't see. I'm blind, but I'm not wearing them because I, I don't want that in my eye because I'm a sissy. Here you go. You're tougher than me. A moat, a little dry stock, but you know what the beam is? People say, ah, it's a big beam. They, you know how it built the house. No, when you look it up, it's just simply a stick of lumber, maybe a little sliver, a little something bigger than that. And when you look it up and you say, wait a minute, what is he trying to say? To judge somebody, it's important. You need to decide or distinguish or, hey, I need to figure something out. But it actually can mean to condemn somebody, to damn somebody. We are not to judge others in the person and judge them in the reflection of their person or their heart. But we are to look at Actions, circumstance, what you did. But when you start looking in Mike Pratt's heart and say, I know why you did that, whoa, whoa, that's what Jesus is telling these Pharisees because they knew everything about everybody. They were the experts at the temple. They would say, you're no rotten good. You're doing wrong. I know your heart is far from God. You're evil and you're wicked. And Jesus is saying, whoa, 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 whoa. That's not the way that you will go about my Old Testament law. Improper inspection, people, this is for you and me, comes from blindness in us. While the proper inspection happens when we see Jesus' perspective for us, Let's sit on that for a moment. You know, Jesus' perspective for you is to see with his eyes the lost soul before you. To see with his eyes your brother and sister in the Lord that have a hurt and a pain that you might be able to pray for them. He wants you to see people as he sees them with his eyes. Because remember, he taught something back in Matthew chapter number six. If I can be reminded of it, Verse, 30, verse 22, the light of the body is the eye. If therefore thine eye be single, thy whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, oh gosh, 
Then I gotta check myself inside and my home inspection reveals that I see people in a bad way. And I judge their hearts. And I'm hurtful and I'm mean and I'm nasty. But when we see Jesus' perspective for us, he sees you. Oh, he sees you in the beauty of the converted life, the new creature in Christ. You are new in Christ, and he sees you that way. And that's when I look at my home inspection, I'm going, improper home inspection can happen. But the proper inspection, because I don't want that blindness in me. I don't see myself the way I ought to. You see, Jesus is saying, watch out also, too, that you don't just take a shallow look in your home inspection. Oh, well, I look pretty good here. Well, when I look down on my stomach, I don't look that good. Oh, my gosh. But we're not talking about looking on the outside. We're looking on the inside. But on the opposite side, watch out. Because you could be taking yourself through a spiritual autopsy every day and beating yourself to death, and then the devil says, I got you. It's right and it's proper to open the scriptures and make those judgments about your own heart according to God's word. But remember that Jesus Christ wants us to have the light and salt that he spoke of in chapter 6 as the way that we are as new creatures in Christ. And I see me and see others that way. Verse number 11 that highlights the next section. Remember I said, ask, seek, know. Verse number 11 tells us, if ye then be an evil know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good things to them that ask? Wow. It says in chapter number 11 of Luke, you don't have to turn there, it says in the text there, Jesus says, if a son shall ask bread of any of you that is a father, will you give him a stone? If he asked a fish, would you give him a serpent? And he also says, if he asked for an egg, would you offer him a scorpion? Woo! So, so, if I'm this person that's going to the Father in heaven and saying, Father, I'm inspecting myself, but more importantly, I want you to inspect me and do a home inspection on me. So my ask, my seek, and my no is about someone receiving something from you, not necessarily from me, then what type of spiritual renewal and refreshment can that give me on a daily basis because now I'm going to look to the father and say hey father I need proper inspection how do I do that well look at what it says on the screen improper inspection from comes from evil in our flesh this flesh we still carry around can't wait to be in glory you won't have to worry about this flesh anymore it's still though part of that because it says hey you being evil, evil in the flesh. This right here, it can happen. You say, we well, stay closer to the Lord, then it doesn't rise up as much. You're right. Because while proper inspection happens when we pray over the Father's provision for us. Father, I'm looking for your provision. Father, I'm looking for how you can take care of things and not me. Father, I know that you can do something for my brother and sister in the Lord. I'm looking to your provision in my home inspection time of ask, seek, and knock. If you spend your time in prayer asking for you all the time, then that tells me what you're all about. It also tells me in this whole passage of Scripture, when he puts that in the middle of that, that this idea of going to the Father and understanding that he provides everything. You ask him for something, he gives it to you in the name of Jesus. He gives it to you, believer. He said he would. Hitherto you have asked nothing in my name. Asking you receive that your joy may be full. He says in, in John chapter number 15, if ye abide in me and my words abide in you, you ask what you will and it shall be done unto you. That means you and I need to abide in him. You know how much that'll change the way you judge life? The way I judge life? Wow, if I would just live according to what Jesus taught. If I would just live according to what the church has been told. That's what Mark has to do. More of that and more of that. We're not done yet getting closer to the Lord. The Father gives. And so if he can give, then I can give. Give what? A heart of kindness with eyeballs of love to see people the way that he sees them. 
It goes back to that first part and that part about abiding in me as I abide in him. He then shows me things. I can judge properly. I can know eternity. I can understand people. That's how this works. So it lends us into and puts us into this last piece about how he puts out verse number 13 and 14 right after that verse 12 that we already taught on. Enter ye in the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Wow, that means the funnel that's really big. People are still on the big side of the funnel instead of the little side of the funnel because it says in verse number 14, straight is the gate, narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. There are two ways for eternal destination, and there's two ways for the temporal existence. You and I have to do some home inspection according to Jesus' teaching and say, hey, that's not just for those Pharisees and Sadducees and all those scribes and all those people back 2,000 years ago. This Scripture is for me, proper home inspection. In order for us to see what home inspection in light of this statement that Jesus is making works, we need to realize that improper inspection comes from our old life of sinfulness. But again, you're righteous in God's eyes through Jesus Christ. Sometimes that sin just visits you for a minute. And that's when I can easily have the wrong perspective. But it says there, while proper inspection happens based on the Holy Spirit's fruit in our life. Oh, the Holy Spirit's fruit in our life. We experienced that yesterday. We saw the love and the joy. We saw the beautiful peace and long-suffering I saw a young Dan down there with a couple of six or seven year olds. Oh my goodness. Now Dan, he's a young man over here. You get a chance to say hi to him after service. He's only like 23, 24. The white goatee means nothing. He's down there showing that little five and six and seven year olds and I'm watching him and I'm just marveling at his patience and long suffering and kindness and gentleness and goodness and love. You can't manufacture that in a moment because you're doing a clinic. It has to be your cup running over. And when I witness that, and I have that in my own life, then I realize that proper inspection is going to go on in my own life because that's what I want. You thought I was going to stay there because I couldn't get up, right? <laughs> Proper inspection happens based on the Holy Spirit having that fruit in my life. People say, well, remember old preachers, you need to be a fruit inspector. Check on all those other people. Why don't you and I do a little home inspection and see what kind of fruit the Holy Spirit of God is doing in me and doing in you. We had a neat theme a couple years back in our Acts 1-8 conference, Evidence of Life. It had a lot to do with John chapter number 15. When I think of Jesus teaching his disciples near the end of his life, he left them some powerful, powerful truths. But he exemplified something that is right up here on the screen. I don't know if you can get enough of John 17. It's one of the most beautiful chapters in all the Bible. When Jesus asks seeks and knocks at the portals of heaven to his Father. And he shows you and me the kingdom view of the Son of the living God. You see, our homes need inspection, these homes right here. And when I think about what ask, seek, and knock can do for me, I can totally and completely understand what Jesus wants these Pharisees and religious people to know just as me. Your righteousness is not founded in yourself, Mark Brown. Your righteousness is found in me, the one who saved you with his blood. Would you please bow for a word of prayer?